So Steve Sherlock here for Franklin Matters, Franklin Public Radio, and Franklin TV in this case, doing a video interview with one of our council candidates, candidates for town council specifically, <laughs> Glenn Jones. Glenn, how are you doing this evening? Good evening, Steve. How are you doing, my friend? Good to see you again. Indeed. So for people who may not know, who's this Glenn Jones? <laughs> Why don't you give them kind of your short Franklin story or however long you want to make it? <laughs> uh, Steve, I'd be very happy to give them that story. <laughs> um, well, um, I grew up and I was born in Cambridge and raised in Watertown. I met my wife in Brighton, actually over in, in the awesome Brighton area. And uh, she was from Rosendale. So we're both officially from the city. But we were in the process of getting married, looking for a place to live. And my mother, and the funny story goes that my mother was the real estate agent. And she says to me, she goes, well, I think we found the house you're looking for. But it's in this small town and called Franklin. So me and Nicole looked at each other. And the first thing that popped in our heads was, where's Franklin? You know, back then in 1998, uh, never heard of it. It was to mm -hmm. us, it was some kind of. Uh, farm country out out west, someplace past 128, and back then anything past 128 seemed like a uh, cow town. So we we jumped on 495, and the funny story goes that when we jumped on 495, we thought we were it was taking forever to get out of here, and there were maybe six cars on the road at the time. So we got off at the exit, which at back then it was exit 17, and it was a stop sign coming onto a two lane road. And we drove up uh, West Central Street and we pulled onto School Street where we was one of the houses we were looking at. And we just fell in love with the house. And we, uh, the, 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 the people who owned the host house then, they were kind enough to show us the house. They were kind enough to show us the backyard. And we were happy with the neighborhood. And we raced back to Watertown and we put a bid on it on the house. And that started my history story here in Franklin with Nicole. We got married uh, not long after finding this house. Um, and we've been here ever since. So that's been 28 years. But Nicole and I have been married uh, for 25 years. And um, actually, it was 25 years ago that we got married and moved in the house. And we've raised five children in this wonderful town. You know, the, one, one thing that has made this town so great for us, other than just the great offerings it has from the library to the school system to all the fun amenities and recreation was the very community feel that this town has i mean mm -hmm. it, it's never lost that feeling and it's never lost that appeal and and it's i've actually seen it just almost recently in the happenings around town where it, there's such a, a sense of community in this town and that's what nicole and i were looking for to really start a family um, so I have five children. I touched base on that a second ago. Uh, my oldest daughter, Dakota, she's 24. She uh, currently lives in Austin, ironically. Um, my daughter, Jillian, she's 23. She also lives in Austin. She just moved to Austin, too. Um, and my daughter, uh, Rebecca, she's 15. And my, my other daughter, Sabrina, she is 13. Um, my son, who sneaks right smack dab in the middle, at 19, he actually just graduated from Franklin High School and currently, uh, believe it or not, goes across the street to Dean College. He's mm. a college student who, he, you know, many you don't hear many uh, interesting, interesting stories of people who graduated Franklin High School and go to Dean College. But um, like my son did. And part of the reason he chose Dean College was because of the um, drama program. He's a he's an actor. He's in the he's arts, performing arts, actor. right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So all of my children went through the Franklin public school systems and it's very, it has served them all well. i currently have two more left in the system. I hate to put it that way, but <laughs> uh, I have one in ninth grade. I have one in seventh grade and um, they, they love it. They've always enjoyed the public schools here in town and all of my children. I think one of the main topics that comes up when we discuss uh, schools nowadays is uh, they all went through Davis there. And Davis there was right across the street from my house. And it was so great to grow up in such a wonderful neighborhood. The Davis there neighborhood, the Davis there uh, neighbors and the families that have been part of this community have been just so great to grow up and it was very inviting. Um, so but a little bit about me, a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm an electrician by trade. Um, and I, I started working 
in the field back in 1998, as soon as I graduated from high school. I did my apprenticeship up until 90, 1992. Uh, those were some tough times. I spent most, most of the 90s from 92 up until around 2000. Uh, working in the electronic engineering field. I worked for a couple of uh, companies, one of which was a laser company called General Scanning. They made laser optical systems. And then I worked for another engineering company called Micro Optical, where we were designing uh, wearable heads up displays and doing a few projects for DARPA and the military. Um, my first daughter was born in 1999. And my wife said to me, she says, you need to join the union. And um it would be a better fit for you. So I said, okay. So I joined on to the union, Local 103 out of Boston. And I've been in that local for almost 23 years now. And what that is, is the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And um, during my career, I've I've done many things from building uh, Gillette Football Stadium uh, to working on projects here in town, uh, things from the food pantry to 15 Beaver Court, and when I was the fun part about 15 Beaver Court was at the time I was working for Tri County Regional Vocational Technical High School as a full time um, teacher, electrical mm -hmm. teacher. And I had several students help me build that project. Um, my specialties uh, everything from computers uh, to electronics to house wiring, commercial, residential, and industrial type of wiring. Um, but mainly, uh, I work as a teacher now. So I work as a full-time instructor over at JATC of uh, Boston. It's over in Dorchester. Many people may recognize uh, the location because the real landmark for us is the turbine that you see off of the highway. Plus, we have a really large sign uh, right in front of our, our union hall. It's also right across the street from that very familiar uh, painted tank that everyone yes. loves to talk yeah. about. That's the landmark for that area yeah. over there in Dorchester. Um, but I teach full time I'm full and I enjoy teaching. We have about 1700 apprentices in our school and we're looking to grow the program. We just recently renovated the building and um, my wife works as a full time nurse. This is actually her workstation. I'm actually in her <laughs> space right now, but she works as a telephonic nurse. She's actually uh, she's worked as a psych psychiatric nurse, uh, pediatric nurse, and um, now she works for a company called CCA where she does uh telephonic nurse. So and uh that's about it. I mean I fell in love with this town and and I'm never gonna I'm probably never gonna leave. My wife jokes she goes, you're gonna they're gonna they're gonna bury your ashes here as soon as uh <laughs> as soon as they actually get you off the council and out of politics at some point. But I do I really do love it in this community and, and my my family loves it here. I just find it ironic that my two older children have made their way back to the place that my wife and I started from. So everything goes full circle. What goes around comes around, they say, right? Yes, sir. And Steve, you know, I have to admit, people like yourself, who, have, who I met, what, what feels like, you know, a long time ago, almost 15, 15 years ago, when I was getting into the campaigning, running for town council originally, Back in 2008, I was going around the town uh, visiting various locations from the senior mm -hmm. centers to all the different committees and the subcommittees. I had met various people um, on the uh, open space committee. I was on the open space committee back then. Um, and I made a, a real goal. Number one, my number one goal back in 2008 was to familiarize myself with the happenings of the town. And that was visiting all the different committees, subcommittees. Uh, boards, etc. I spent about a year um, visiting the front town council and getting to know how they work. And that's actually where I met you um, when you were first starting out your efforts as, as uh, Franklin Matters. And we've known each other since. And, mm -hmm. and I'm very proud to call you a friend, Steve. Thank you. Yep. Good. So certainly you've mentioned in that uh and since you've also spent time since then on the council, um, certainly engaged in the community, uh, the yes, democratic sir. process as well. Um, regular voting is certainly encouraged. Um, you want to speak to that as well? Oh, absolutely. It, it's it, that's a good question. I was actually just looking something up, and I, and I was read. You know, it's it's to quote, it's a right to vote is essential. Well-functioned democracy is, is the most enshrined right by our Constitution. And, and you know what? I'm a firm believer in that because growing up, the one th my father was a Marine, just a little bit of a backstory to this. And he was a true-blooded, true-blue American 
and he had he believes in this country he fought for this country as a marine and he instilled in me that that one basic understanding in life that if you don't vote if you don't do your part it's really mm -hmm. hard to make a change and to complain about something if you have if you yourself are not actually doing your part in the democracy and there is no better right that's given to us as american citizens than the right to vote mm -hmm. and I have made every effort since I, I could first vote back in 1988 when I turned 18 years old. I think I just missed the first Bush. Um, I did. I missed the first Bush and Reagan vote back in 1998. I believe it was 98 that the, the vote was for, for, um, for Bush. And I had just missed that election. So I've been voting ever since. I'm, I'm by... Uh, by the way, it's described. I'm a level A voter. I vote in both local, um, state, and federal elections, and I think everybody should. Uh, most important part of voting, though, Steve, is that people need to learn about their candidates. So, like this interview, for instance, mm -hmm. um, people should go out. They should listen to people's interviews. They should read articles about their their these people's. Learn and be an educated voter because. Who do you want running your state? Who do you want running your country? Who do you want running your town? And speaking of the town, as myself, a fellow town counselor, I think many, many people don't actually realize how much of an effect we as local um, counselors have on their everyday business because we set we set the tax rates here in the town. Uh, we set the policies we, we set the bylaws and the rules and the zoning and trash pickup and road repairs, uh, schools, et cetera, et cetera. So local politics plays a big part in everyday life. And people need to go out and learn as much as they can about the people that they're going to vote for. And I have and always will continue to support individuals kind of stepping up to the plate coming out of their you know their their uncomfortable zone and and stepping into the light a little bit and learning how the process works being a part of the process and every single time i see new faces that come up and are eager to be a part of the process it makes me so happy you know it almost makes me feel like i've done my job successfully and being a cheerleader for local politics in the community where people now step up and take part and, and kind of take the reins. And that also allows people, I'm sorry, I'm rambling on about this, but that actually allows people an opportunity to see the inner workings. Because mm -hmm. when I first got involved in this process back in 19, 2008, um, I had, hadn't really had a vast background in local community and let alone understanding how all that worked. All I was getting my news from was from the Country Gazette. If you recall, the Country Gazette, which was one of my favorite weekly um, publications, that was the news that was a week old. Mm -hmm. And you were only getting snippets of information. So I said to my wife back then, this is bothering me. I really need to know what's going on. And I said, that I felt the best way to find out what was going on was to actually be a part of what was going on. And I haven't looked back since. And mm -hmm. I'm just looking forward and I'm hoping to continue that that uh, process but I, I love it when people join when they become a part of the our democracy and they actually learn how this process works i think melanie coined it best in her interview uh, with you recently when she says you know it takes a good two years to to really kind of wrap your brain around how all of this works and, mm -hmm. and it's about it's all about education and learning as much as you can and taking what you learn and applying it back towards making the community and continuing to make the community the best place to live and raise a family. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. So uh, let's highlight at least what you bring to the table in terms of whether your background, certainly you've got some years of experience on the council, but what do you bring to the council in terms of your background, your skill set that helps the council operate in terms of our behalf? No, that's a great question, Steve. Um, I would say, how does my job being an electrician as a master electrician tie into helping manage the town's uh, budget? How does that help me manage banking policy? Um, how does my experience as a, as a father 
Um, how do all that play into my ability to you know, be a good counselor? Well, I'd say I would say many things do. Um, decision making, you know, as a father, I, I have to make some very important decisions based around the health and welfare of my family. And in big picture, that's how I kind of look at the community. It's like it's almost just like an extension of my family where my number one goal is to try to make the best possible decisions for the for the the voters and for the community at large, including our businesses, our small businesses, our big businesses and our nonprofits, our churches and everyone else. It's just it's it's my decision making ability. Um, and also when it comes to being a master electrician. I'm very, very familiar with the process that it takes to start something from nothing and make it into something very large. Mm -hmm. You know, I jokingly said to my apprentices last week, I go, who's the first one on the job? They go, the electrician. I go, right. We show up to the job when it's nothing but dirt. And we're the last ones to leave, turning the lights on and handing everybody the instructions to how their building works. You know, that's the best part about being an electrician is we, we, we start off at a, at a small pace. We start with small projects and we work up towards bigger projects. Um, I've worked on just about every kind of project you can think of from power plants. I've worked on the Bellingham power plant over here. I helped build Gillette football stadium um, back in 2000 and um, State Street, many of the buildings over there. What it really boils down to is my ability to take a set of plans and work with those set of plans to ultimately build the big picture. And then working with the, the contractors and working with the building owners to get their project off of the ground and ultimately get it to their, their final project. And it, I can walk away being proud that I had a big part in making that work. And that's how I feel about being a counselor. And I take that same approach. I try to be pragmatic. I try to be logical. Um, I have, I like to refer to myself as a utilitarian. Um, many people probably doesn't know, don't know what that means, but I'll give you, for instance, and I know I'm going to get, I'm going to get a lot of uh, heat for this, but there had been discussion about tearing down um, Fenway Park and building a new baseball park. And when I, when I heard about that, first of all, it would have been a great project for my apprentices and electricians to work on. I said, Sure. That sounds like a really clever idea because why do we build a baseball park? We build a baseball park to play baseball. And Fenway Park for its time was probably a really cool place to go to, but the seating is old, the building is old, the structure is old, the seating isn't that great. It's not really laid out too well to watch a baseball game. Like for instance, when you're sitting in the grandstands, you're facing center fields, you know, it, it, it's, it has, it had its day, it had its history and maybe it's time to move on and build something new. This was when they were talking about building it. Obviously they changed their mind and kept the old building, but you know, the, the Yankees did it. I, I hate to bring up the Yankees, but they had 26 world series wins in Yankee stadium. And they still were, were logical enough to realize that this building's seen its day. We need to build something new and start building a new legacy in a new building. And that's kind of some of the mindset I had when we were um, looking at the plans to build the new Franklin High School. So I was on the council at the time when the plans came across our desk to uh, from the M working with the MSBA to build a new high school. We were working off of what was referred to as the model plan. And yeah. we looked at about four different models one of which was the Whitman Hansen project. And when I saw that model, the first thing that popped into my head was perfect. It's a perfect design. It's like a, it's like a racetrack. You turn left, you turn left, you turn left, you're back where you started. It's three levels. It's got sunlight in between. It's a very simple, but it, it serves the purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's a very appealing building. And that's always been my approach. I looked at the old building. I said to myself, is it worth keeping? And the logical answer to that was no, because it was too old. It was too worn out for as nostalgic and as much history as it created. It was time to move on to something new. And that's kind of how I approach everything with a very pragmatic, very logical uh, planning type of approach. And sometimes in life, you have to look at things and say, what's best? I'll give you an example. Unfortunately, I don't have much say in this because I'm in a butter. Uh, <laughs> but as I spoke earlier about Davis there, where all my children are right. going to Davis there, um, there's discussion on what would be the best use for building that was built in 1924. Um, you know, what runs through my head for as a decision maker is how could we best utilize the building to fit much of what the community's needs are, but 
what's the cost? You know, how much, how much is it going to cost the community to turn it into some of this building or even, even differently, if it were, if it did go to a 501c3 nonprofit, how much money would have to be invested in order to bring it up to code in order to get it to, to be suitable for those needs? And would it be a viable, long, sustainable project? Mm -hmm. um, and there are many decisions and that's going to come up with the Davis State Reuse Committee. So, I mean, there, I have my own thoughts on it. Um, and hopefully we'll we'll come up with a suitable decision. But which leads me to my next point, which is as the chairman of the master plan, I was appointed to the uh, as chair to the master plan committee. Um, we're taking our existing 2013 master plan, which had had a little bit of updating in 2020. Um, and we're looking to write a new 10 year plan based off of some of the goals. So what our what our committee is doing, it's a 13 person committee. Uh, is we're going through all the various goals that were set back in 2013, everything from land use to zoning to housing to cultural aspects, historical aspects, and looking at those objectives that were set back then, crossing off the list what had been done, uh, kind of revamping some that we would like to keep. But we're also really looking for some input from the community as to how they would like to see Franklin over the next 10 years. And this is kind of both an interview slash outreach to the community saying, what do you want your, your town to be? How do you want this to look 10 years from now? Let's make a plan. Let's sit down, take what we have, which is a great foundation, and then move it forward into making this the best, continuing to make this place the best, uh, but live and raise a family, small business. I mean, it's such a, such a great, great such a great time. Mm -hmm. So, yep. sorry. I think that'll give us a good segue to the next question where in one of your key roles, certainly the hiring of the town administrator, managing him, mm -hmm. because then he runs everything else in the town, but your yes, other sir. key role is the annual budget. Certainly the yes. school committee does their piece. You give them a line item, they manage the rest of that. But from what we've seen in the forecast for the next few years, at least, um, there's going to be some challenging times, some tough decisions. Yes. Yes. Um, what kind of prioritizations? And I think you've alluded to some of that, but I just want to rephrase that in terms of the budget decisions mm -hmm. that you and the council will be faced over the next couple of years. Well, I wish I could say this was my first rodeo uh, with this, but it's not. Um, we went through some very hard times back in the, the recession. Mm -hmm. Back to the when the recession hit in 2008 and the market fell, the housing market fell, uh, and we were in some really tough times back in 2009, 2010, all the way through 2011, when when some light was finally starting to shed itself. Um, we had to make some tough decisions, you know. Um, as I'm sure it's been explained in, in many facets by many counselors, the only way that, that the community, meaning that the town government, has a means to raise additional funding is through property taxes. And it's set at two and a half every single year based on Proposition two and a half. So we aren't, we're not just, we're not a, a company in the sense that we can raise fees or, or raise prices and just willy nilly do whatever we have to do to try and raise additional funding. It's just, it doesn't work like that. We we are restricted to where we can get money, and that is through property taxes. <clears throat> so if the community so chooses to give additional funding to support the budget, we can always put forth a, uh, a operational override. But there, haven't, there hasn't been a lot of success with that. And whenever we have unsuccessful overrides or when we hit tough times like we did back in 2009, 2010, it, what it ultimately boils down to is making those tough decisions. We have to look at the big picture and say to ourselves, okay, what can we keep? You know, I, I equate it kind of to my own household here. When, when times get tough, I was laid off for, I think, seven, eight months back in 2009. Um, you have to look at the budget, your own budget and your own personal um, wishes and, and needs and say to yourself, all right, where are we going to make the cuts? Does it mean, you know, just using the house as, as an example, does it mean that we cut back on cable television? Do we cut the cord? Uh, do we cut back on, on gas use? Do we cut back um, on uh, food expenses? Do we start clipping coupons? You know, that's what I would do here at the house. But when it comes to the town, there aren't a lot of options because, <clears throat> excuse me, the largest cost, or I should say the largest cost driver for the town's budget is payroll. And 
nine out of 10 times, whenever something has to be cut, it's typically a, it's either a layoff or it's a cut in department. And what that means is like back in 2009, it could have been four police officers. It could have been firefighters. It could have been librarians. It could mean closing the library on more days. It could mean making some really drastic cuts to our services that pe that ultimately at the end of the day, nobody wants. Nobody wants to cut any of the services that this community has to offer because it's what makes the community such a great place to live. The good news is, is that we were able to get through those hard times and and the value of the community went up. We've continued to be named number one, one of the number one communities in the country. And that helps bolster our, our income through economics. You know, we have 20 percent of our budget is based on commercial industrial uh, and those businesses are thriving. Um, which is a good thing. We've attracted some really good businesses over there. We've offered a TIF to Hamilton Technologies, who came into town. We held Cold, Cold Snap, um, which is a company that really grew a lot since the COVID pandemic. Uh, Cold, Cold Chain. Cold Chain, I'm sorry, Cold Chain. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to edit that one out of there. <laughs> Get the Cold Chain. I had Cold Snap on my brain. Um, and and so many other good businesses in the community that have helped helped us afford to have a lower tax rate because i think one of the, one things that many people don't realize is that our lower tax rate in general is based on our valuation of the community as a whole which i think if i recall off the top of my head we're about a 4.6 billion dollar community um but if the time comes in the next year or two and to answer your question if we have to make some more tough decisions there are very few places that we can make those we can make those choices uh, more than likely, it would mean making personnel cuts, um, and which would mean a, a, a diminishment in services provided. And that's that's not something we're looking to do. Uh, we're always looking for new and interesting ways to kind of pinch a penny. And as the expression has been said many times over the year, you know, cut it to the bone. Um, we don't want to be in the position where we're cutting it to the bone because so many things get lost in the mix. Uh, like, for instance, the schools, you know, the schools uh, and myself as an instructor, uh, teachers, they deserve so much for all the hard work that they do teaching our children. Um, it's been so tough keeping teachers on the rolls. Um, they deserve the pay that they deserve. But, you know, the school's budget is always just as much a challenge as the town's budget when it comes to insurances, uh, you know, overall overhead cost, busing, et cetera. Uh, that those things are just going up. You know, we as a community face the same issues that my household does. You know, when when times get tough, um, inflation comes along, comes along like it does right now. You know, the gas prices go up, electric bill goes up, uh, fuel costs go up <clears throat> for fueling my car. And in the town as a whole, we face those same problems. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to gas police cars. We have to gas TPW trucks. We have to have busing to bus our kids. Um, so what it boils down to, and it has always boiled down to one thing, and that's the community's input. You know, the community needs to come out, the citizens need to come out, and they need to speak with us. They need to speak with, with the counselors, and they need to speak with the town administrator, and they need to speak with the finance committee, and they need to speak with the school committee and say, okay, if times get tough, this is what we need. There's always a what we want picture, but this is what we need. And when we make these decisions, I want to I want to sit down and make it with the community as as a whole, so they understand what's how it's going to be impacted. But with full faith and understanding that we're going to get through this, just like we did back in two thousand nine and two thousand and ten. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for taking time to elaborate on uh, your positions, your background, skill set. Etc. And certainly uh, justifiably gave the plug in there for the master plan as well. I endorse that the master plan certainly gives us as a community and you on our behalf, you know, what is the vision? What do we want to be when we grow up in the next 10 years? Uh, right. We've certainly evolved. How will we continue to evolve? That's in our control at this point. Um, is there something you want to leave with the voters that we haven't discussed? Uh, keep faith. You know, keep faith in just being the great people that you are, because it's it's really the citizens that make this community so great. You know, just I, I can't. I was almost so giddy the other day. I was over at the cons, and it was the, the unfortunately the last farmers market that was being held. Mm. But I was in such a good mood because 
the the citizens voted to support building a new school in Franklin, you know, Tri County Regional Vocational Technical High School. Eighty percent of the voters voted approve approving that building. Um, you know, it was a beautiful day on Friday, and so many people were out at the at the, at the farmers market, um, visiting everybody, getting their last purchases in before the full you know cold day like today would come along. Yesterday was such a beautiful day. Uh, Saturday they had a, a trunk or treat up at the library. They had the, the fire department had a great event going on. And then the police department also had a Halloween party where it was packed and it mm -hmm. was packed with so many citizens. And I was just so happy and giddy to see everyone out and about and enjoying the, the great, the great town of Franklin. And, and I, I could, I could sit there all night, Steve, and just boast about <laughs> how many wonderful things there are about this town, but just seeing people out and about and enjoying everything. That's, one thing I enjoy so much. Mm -hmm. It's really why I do what I do, and and I just love what I do so much. Is is the reward of 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 the smiles of the mm -hmm. kids getting what they want, and and the parents being happy, and uh, ultimately the citizens getting what they need. So, yep. Well, thank you for that. Well, thank you. And Steve. we'll uh, that'll give us a nice segue as well that the citizens and voters, particularly, I'm assuming most of you are registered. Generally, the registrations have been fairly high. Mm -hmm. um, do take your opportunity to vote either by mail, in person. There are still some in person opportunities in the town clerk's office before the election, and then certainly on election day. Tuesday, November 7th from 6 a.m. through 8 p.m. at the high school. Uh, the precincts will be in order in this particular case because it's a mm. town election as opposed to tri-county. It was just an alphabetical list, so the precincts didn't matter. Um, the vote counted, but the vote and the precincts count this time around. Mm. So I think, and oh, uh, contact info. Uh, I know you're on Facebook. Your contact info is on the town page as well. Any preference yes, in terms of other ways to contact you? I can always be reached at my town email account, uh, gjones at franklinma.gov. If anybody has any questions or comments or input or they'd like to be a part of the process, please send me an email. Um, my phone number, I can, I, you know, if you email me and if you're looking for to contact me directly, I can always give you my phone number. Um, but I do have a Facebook page, Glenn Jones uh, Franklin Town Council. And I also have um, Glenn Jones, uh, just a regular Facebook page too, if you'd like to like my page. And uh, we can be friends and I can share as much information as you would like. Um, the one thing I will admit is that I'm a, I'm a factual person. I just, the, whole, the facts, the whole facts, and nothing but the facts. As the clerk of the council, that's my job. <laughs> Indeed. Well, thank you for taking time you, today sir. to uh, share this. Uh, with the uh, voters, residents, and community of Franklin. We encourage you as well, uh, listeners, to vote on or before November 7th. And yes, a final sir. reminder, we do this because Franklin matters. Yes, it does.